Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy on us all as we listen and reflect and act on the gospel. It's a common claim among Christians, almost a truism. At least we feel it to be true, even if we never really question it. And that claim is, we're better off than the first disciples because we know the rest of the story. You've heard that, right? We know now that Jesus wasn't really trying to take over the political throne of Herod. We know now that the kingdom is a much bigger thing than any earthly realm. We know now that resurrection followed crucifixion. We know now that the Holy Spirit is poured out on Jesus' followers, and we have with us eternally the Spirit of Jesus. We now have the inspired epistles of the apostles, and these writings to us are scripture. We know so much more about the nature of Jesus and of the kingdom of God. We know the end game. So aren't we glad we're not in the position of Peter, James, and John and company who had to bumble along without knowing everything that we are now in the position to know. In the Gospels, when we read that the disciples innocently say something to Jesus that we know is silly or short-sighted, we chuckle and we give them a pass. Well, they just don't, didn't know what we know now. Hmm. Is following Jesus really easier today, knowing what we know? Are we doing a better job of getting Jesus than they did? Of understanding who Jesus was? Of knowing what he wanted of his followers? I don't think so. I think if we disciples today measured ourselves honestly against the disciples who walked with Jesus in Galilee, I think we would have to admit at least two things. One, if we had been there with them, we would have done no better than they did. And two, even today, with our fuller picture of Jesus, our attempts to follow Jesus are often even more anemic and bumbling than theirs. But there's no good reason to even compare or keep score, because no matter when and where and in what cultural context, following Jesus is hard, really hard. So take today's gospel reading. What does it mean? to sell all and follow me. Why is it hard for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? And what about leaving everything, including house, mother, brother? When Jesus said those things in Mark 10, it tells us in verse 24, the disciples were perplexed at these words. Now, if those words are just as confounding today, and I think they are, then I think it's safe to say that not much has changed since Mark. The disciples are still perplexed. So what's the first step toward understanding how we might live out these hard teachings of Jesus today? Maybe it's to think more deeply about what those words might have meant to the disciples who actually walked with Jesus in Galilee, and maybe even more interestingly and importantly, what it might have meant to the Jesus followers who first heard the Gospel of Mark read to them and for whom it was probably written. If you recall, when I introduced this book a little over a month ago, there is a presumed origin story of this gospel and its social and political context. 
Many scholars speculate that the gospel took shape under the influence of the preaching of the Apostle Peter, written down by Peter's secretary and interpreter, John Mark, while both of them were residing in Rome, the capital city and center of political and military power for the Roman Empire. And the time frame was somewhere around 65 AD during the so-called Jewish-Roman War, or more accurately, the Roman oppression and genocidal attack against the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. It wasn't really a war between equal opponent, opponents. And based on the kind of narrative details that Mark includes or doesn't include, we can assume the intended audience are Gentile Roman citizens. Now, what would, do you think it would have taken to persuade Gentile Roman citizens who were presumably living fairly secure lives to become devoted followers of Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus, the charismatic leader of a Jewish sect who started a movement and got himself executed by Roman authorities in Jerusalem a few decades earlier, and whose followers were to this day still being persecuted all over the Mediterranean world, put yourself in their shoes. You are a protected citizen of the Roman Empire. What would it take for you to jump ship and declare that you are now on the side of those that your emperor is waging war against. And not just to join the Jewish cause in general, but specifically to join a Jewish sect that even mainstream Judaism did not recognize or support. Now talk about making yourself vulnerable. And just to add to that mess, you'd be making yourself a persona non grata, cutting yourself off from your neighbors, your family, your ability to earn a living. What would it take for you in that situation to sign on as a Jesus follower? Those are the shoes we should put on in our imagination when we delve into the Gospel of Mark. Those are the imaginary shoes we should be wearing when we hear Jesus say to the young man who had many possessions, go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. And then listen to these words with the ears of a secure Roman citizen who enjoys social and financial security, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Yes, indeed, it would be hard for said Roman citizen to throw every security on the line and follow Jesus. And that part about leaving everything behind, house and brothers and sisters and mother and father and children and fields for God's sake or for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the good news, Jesus was not exaggerating to make a point. This is not a hypothetical situation. That is literally what it would have meant for the first intended readers of the Gospel of Mark to say yes to Jesus. They would have had to leave everything because following Jesus would have, by definition, cut them off from their present lives. And then Peter replies to Jesus, look, we have left everything and followed you. And of course, we remember that story where Peter and company left their boats and nets and walked away to follow Jesus. I imagine that story 
got repeated a lot in Peter's preaching as he made his way around the Roman Empire in those days. Not to exalt himself or to boast, but to encourage his listeners. He knew very well that for them to join the Jesus movement would be just as much of a sacrifice. So he's saying, many others, including myself, have already chosen this path. And despite the cost, we highly recommend it. The life you get in return is worth it all. Everything you give up, you will get back in return in this life and the next. A hundredfold, Mark says in verse 30. A hundred times as many siblings and parents and households as you walked away from. This is a hard teaching, no? The, the disciples today are still perplexed. I am still perplexed, to be perfectly honest. It's hard to know how to make this a gospel word for my life. Now, I know how Christians today tend to work with these texts. They typically take one of two approaches. Either they take it quite literally and assume that true followers will indeed sell off everything and choose a life of poverty and communalism. The model to emulate are the monks and nuns who, at least since the fifth century, have been taking vows of poverty and selling off personal property and living in full community with one another. Or they dismiss it as impractical for modern life and culture. No, we aren't expected to actually sell things off and live as paupers. We're asked to be good stewards, to be generous with what we have, to share widely and put our wealth to good purposes. Now, neither of those approaches impress me as capturing the heart of the gospel. The essence of what Jesus wants of us as disciples. One of them makes the barrier so high that very few can reasonably expect to make it the attempt and say yes to Jesus. The other makes it so low that saying yes to Jesus doesn't really cost very much. It just means you do good things in life. I think the core, the message here, is that following Jesus is hard. It does involve holding lightly to those things that make us feel safe and secure. An abundance of possessions, financial wealth, social respect and prestige and privilege, spacious and comfortable and safe homes, available time and resources for recreation and travel and the things that most of us strive for. I'll be honest, all of that describes me. And simple Mennonite pastors are not typically criticized for their excessive wealth and leisure. But still the burden is on me to continually ask myself whether my comfort, my security, my social position is making it difficult to say a clear yes to going where Jesus is going. Because that's what following Jesus means, going where Jesus is going. Am I listening carefully and seeing clearly where the gospel of Jesus is moving in our world today? And am I quick to find excuses not to go there because I can't take the risk? It might put my job and reputation on the line. It might cut into my retirement fund and 
endanger my grandchildren's inheritance and other people won't understand or support me. You know, I'm, I'm simply not going to speculate for anyone in my hearing what it means for you to follow Jesus in your own context. You'll need to come to terms with your own life and priorities and ask yourself the same question. Whether you are living with the courage of Peter and dropping your nets, your safety nets, whatever those might be for you, and saying, yes, it's worth the risk to lay those down and take the next step in following Jesus. Following Jesus is more than being a morally good person. To take Jesus seriously still takes a lot of courage. But be of good courage. The securities you give up may just come back to you a hundredfold. Grace and peace encourage to us all.